Are you ready to go deeper into Carly Worth's story? If you didn't already know, she is the first person here on Walk to Wealth to appear twice. Her episode was in the top 10 last year, so I had to bring her back on for in person. And today we're going to be talking about what it was really like, you know, dealing with investors, how she was able to make it through in this jam-packed, super quick episode. So we got a bit of an audience today, not like the first time we had our podcast, right? A little bit different, right? Hey, everyone. <laughs> so, Carly, right, Walk to Wealth, right? I want you to share right now, especially because I got people that from brand new in real estate, like my boy Darren, to people that are kind of interested in getting started, to people who already got their license and are transacting in real estate currently. What was it like getting started? Because I know you had your personal fitness thing going. You had that going pretty well. You have a pretty big following, right? Yeah. Getting over 10K followers on IG is, not, is a pretty big merit on its, in its own, right? But then you made the transition. So tell us, what was that like getting started in real estate? So I, it was during COVID, I kind of had like, I guess you could call it a God moment. And I was managing a gym in New Haven at the time. And I was still doing my personal training privately. And like everyone, COVID kind of flipped the world upside down. And the gym shut down. And I was just kind of thinking like, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to be like passionate about? And a couple of my friends actually had always told me over the years, like, you should get into real estate. You should get into real estate. I'm like, I'm not a super salesy person, though. Like, I could be salesy without actually trying to be mm -hmm. salesy. Um, and I was in Newport, Rhode Island, and there were a group of girls across the street, and it's like the whole world went silent, and all I heard was, oh, do you real estate? And I was like, okay, I think that's, that's like a sign to me. So I got home from Newport a couple days later and went and started my classes that night. So getting into it, especially during the holidays, it was... I think I signed with a broker December 9th. So I got into it obviously at a really weird time. No one's in the office. I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I had someone approach me from my real estate class and was like, hey, I just saw you pass your test. Do you want to help me find my next investment property? So I'm like, sure. I don't know where to begin, but yeah. And within that first week of being licensed, I had my first two deals under contract. No clue what I was doing, but I figured it out. I went to then sell my first property. My first deal ever was in Westport, Connecticut. Mm. He bought it for 300000 He put about 200000 into it. And beginning of last year, we sold it for 850000 So that was my very first deal ever. So that was pretty exciting. So I kind of fell into the investment niche, and that's kind of where I've been ever since. That's where I'm passionate about. Yeah, let's dig it a little deeper, right? Because most people, when they think of real estate, it's, oh, I wanted to get into residential. That's yeah. all I know, right? The most, some people may want to get into commercial depending on maybe they went to school and study for it. But usually people get into real estate as residential. And right off the bat, you was able to get into the investment world, which is the real estate world within itself is so already pretty small, yep. right? But the invest investment world is already a lot smaller because most agents themselves don't even invest. And so you got into the investment world. What was that like just running around with these investors versus running around with like your everyday buyer and seller? It was amazing. <laughs> it was nothing like I thought it would be, to be honest with you. When I got into it, I had the same concept and the idea that I would be the one spending all my weekends showing buyers houses and not having a life. And that was something that I was willing to do at the time. And so I've been two years in as of like four days ago. It's been two years. And I've maybe worked three weekends in two years. So I do not work with residential buyers at all. It's just... I'm more of a business-minded person. I like people that see the value add that are buying something like that's financially makes sense versus yeah. just the emotional aspect of it. And there's a lot of agents that love finding people their forever homes and they get fulfillment from that. But for me, it's it's not really about that. I I like passive income. I like helping people build a legacy and build that passive wealth. So that was kind of the way that I wanted to go. And I just mm. dove really deep started at an investment brokerage. I lend private money, like my own money now. So I'm in like a lot of different areas of the investment space. Yeah. So I remember on your, and when we first interviewed for our podcast, you mentioned that you were burnt out for a little while and yeah. you were going through a pretty dark phase. Share with us, like, what was that like? If you could relive that experience a little bit and what was that like during that dark period and how did you make it out of it? Because I know there's a point in time where you were just like, it was a lot, right? Working with investors. So share yeah. with us that story a little bit and how, what did you do to get out of it? So it was about six months in, I had my first million dollar sale and we were going to go and flip it. 
So it would have been worth about one four five one five. The market mm -hmm. was obviously on, but the investor did not want to listen to what he should have done to it. He wanted to kind of take the easy way out. So he really only rehabbed the inside, left the outside as is. We had 80 showings within 48 hours and we couldn't get above one three. And I was like, we got to do the siding. We got to do the siding. And it was just this exhausting, like back and forth, like calls at 11 p.m., calls at 6 a.m. Every day it was just anxiety attack. When I saw the phone ringing, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I, I, I don't know if I could do real estate anymore. Like, this is too much for me. It's too much handholding, which is why I didn't want to go in with residential buyers. Too much emotion involved. So, yeah, I almost took a step back. I was having really, really, really bad anxiety. And I was like, this isn't worth it. Like, no amount of money is worth, like, this much upset. Mm -hmm. So I finally, like, cut that person off and... That was that was that. We got it. We got it rented. He couldn't hold it any longer, but he didn't want to do the work, so we got it rented. And after that, I ended up getting two phones. And now I have two phones. So at seven seven thirty, if I'm not working on anything, which usually if an attorney is not available, then there's nothing more I can really do. So I I turn that phone off, and it goes away into my desk drawer, and that's it. I don't need to deal with it the rest of the night. If it's there's no emergency in real estate. And I learned that the hard way after almost quitting like six months in. I was and yeah. it's actually my background on my phone now. It says there's no emergency in real estate. Cause there's really not. And it wasn't worth like the stress and anxiety and all that. So it, I'm very choosy now with who I choose to work with and who I decide is not worth yeah. the time and the stress. And so now like once you made it to the other side. Right, you're doing a lot of things now. What does the other side look like? Once you made it past all that stress, all the hand holding and the investor buyers calling you at it, random times throughout the day, now that you're on the other side, you were able to make it to. What does it look? What does life look like now? Now you got some big plans. You're moving to Dallas. What does life look like in terms of your business, your growth, and where you're at? Totally different. It's actually amazing. I love what I do now. I have the freedom now that I choose who I want to work with. I'm lucky to be, actually, I'm incredibly blessed to be where I am now in such a short amount of time. I surpassed my goal last year. I surpassed my goal this year. I'm at a point where I don't need to be chasing people down for deals. I kind of just have all the investors there, and I have wholesalers that send deals to me from Florida, Pennsylvania, California. So I'm kind of like their dispo agent on the ground in Connecticut. So the amount of deal flow I have, I'm starting to work a lot with hedge funds. So my partner and I have a lot of government owned properties that we get in bulk. So we're selling those off to hedge funds. So I've been making connections with hedge funds and institutional and that's something that's going to grow a lot more when I get down to Dallas. So Amazing. looking forward to that. And so for anyone that's looking to start their walk to wealth by getting an investment property or getting into the investment space to finish off, what advice would you give them there from all the investors you've been able to work with and the, those that have found success? and those that haven't. What advice would you give there so people can start getting into that investment space, whether it's as an investor agent or whether that's just getting their first investment? I think being an investment agent, there's not a lot of them because it is very, very different. So it really has to be like a niche that you're comfortable in and really learn about it because there's a lot of different ways you can make deals work. Like even if the actual number doesn't work, there's creative financing deals that you can do to actually make the numbers work. You can pay exactly the number that someone wants that maybe someone's 50,000 under that just by being creative and making a creative finance opportunity. So it's more of seeing the opportunity where other people don't. And it's kind of like the stock market where others are fearful, be greedy. And when mm -hmm. others are greedy, be fearful. So it's really always a good time to invest. I, even when the market's high, yeah. 20 years from now, it's going to be higher than it is now. Definitely do your research. Do your research. Do your due diligence. Don't rely on someone else to tell you if it's a good deal. You really want to know how to assess a property. I would advise people to listen to Bigger Pod or Bigger Pockets. Yeah, Bigger Pockets. Uh, Jerry Norton is amazing. I think his name is Pace Morby. Yeah, he's, Pace Morby. He's also with Jerry Norton. They're the kings on creative financing. So I would definitely look into that and. Same thing with, with Hollis. I'm actually looking into doing a next syndication deal with him as well. But I had an opportunity to lend private money. So that's kind of where I've put my money. Um, 
right now at this point in time, but syndications, good tax write-offs, being a limited partner. So there's a lot of different ways. You just have to kind of get creative. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Kind of like find your own little niche and find people who are good at what they do. Amazing. So Carly, where can we find you at? Where can we connect with you? Whether we want to buy our, our first investment property, whether we wanted to figure out what on earth you did to find success very quickly. Where could we find you at? I'm on Instagram and Facebook. It's R-E, like real estate, with Carly, K-A-R-L-Y. And that is my Instagram as well as my Facebook link. Amazing. So make sure you guys go check her out. Amazing. Go also check out our podcast interview. She was, I think, episode like 13 or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was like Like 13 or 14. Yeah. yeah. It's been a while. Give a round of applause for Carly. Thanks, guys.